G'day, mate. Uh, this is John Dorney, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. Now, we've just been hearing disturbing reports of creatures from the Divergent Universe. I'm going to investigate. Ah! There's flaming new termosons in the toy box. Like and subscribe, mate. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day audiophiles, g'day Dwayne. G'day Philip, I'm very excited. You know why? Yeah, I think I'm excited for the same reason, Dwayne. Well, because the 60th anniversary is coming and we're doing another 60th anniversary themed episode. Oh, well, I was and more excited by the person, to be perfectly honest, but that's okay. <laughs> well, that's all part of it, but I've got to... I've got to say what this is about. And yes, all of our episodes running up to the 60th anniversary are going to have an anniversary type theme. And did you know that it's been almost in January next year, it'll have been 20 years since the Creed of the Cromen. Do you remember that episode, Philip? I do indeed. It changed the shape of Big Finish for a long time. It certainly did. And we're very privileged to have with us uh, the star of that episode, Conrad Westmus. G'day, Conrad. Hello. How are you doing? That was a, that's a quite an introduction. I've never been described as that before, and that's quite something. But thank you. We yeah, can describe lovely. you as many other things along the way, so don't worry about it. Conrad, welcome. Thank you so much. It's absolutely brilliant to be here. Thank you. No, we were the star of that one because we had a, a brand new companion created. We had the Divergent Universe, which was all very exciting. Um, so we're uh, going to be able to talk with you in depth about that. Has it been a while since you've talked about these these times? Um, actually, it hasn't because um, do you know Kenny Smith of yes. Big from Big Finish? Yeah, and we Big know Finish him well. Chris, an expert, and he's wonderful. Well, I think I'm allowed to say this, but basically, because uh, back in the day, the audios we did were all on CDs, and now they're on downloads. Um, some of the downloads don't have extras or interviews and stuff on them. So Kenny has gone back and actually done little little small interviews about some of the stories that we didn't make it that we didn't do interviews or extras for at the time so i've had a little over the last year had to dig out some of these old stories and listen to them and as you say it was, it's 20 years ago so it's that's that's just wild so i have been talking about them a little bit but in a kind of polite official way and that's not what i'm going to do today <laughs> oh good it's actually it's actually probably 20 years since your first release which was actually omega and that was the first thing you actually did for Big Finish, and that is... That, that would have been August, years. yeah. August. 20 years so, in August. So you've been working for Big Finish for over 20 years. I'm so glad you guys know this stuff, because it's just like a blur. You know, it's funny when you watch like a Doctor Who uh, you know, interview or an extra on TV, and they go, yes, I was in the Terror of Fang Rock in 1985. And you're like, stop getting Doctor Who wrong. You were in it. How can you not know? And now I just like, I can't remember what year, what month. But yeah, it's funny. It's all there. In there I, I can't remember either. I've just done some research and made some notes. So <laughs> I just pretend like I know what I'm talking about. As long as one of us does, we're all good. At least one of us is doing notes. I just guess. So you've been a Doctor Who fan for quite some time too, I believe. Yes, I have. Probably about, I'm 52 now, and I've probably been a Doctor Who fan for about 50 of those. Um, so my first memory of anything at all on this planet uh, is the sea devils coming out of the sea. Um, and I looked up, and it was a repeat. It would have been a repeat of it. I think I would have been two, three ish, so probably late, like three year old. And I can vividly remember the sea devils coming out of the sea on a repeat. Hazy memories of Pertwee. I can sort of vaguely remember Alf Centauri, the spiders, that sort of it. But Robot was the first, my first story that I really. I watched every single one since then. My sister was five years older than me, so she loved it. So she was always making sure she was watching it. So I consequently saw everything. So yeah, it was um it was, you know, Tom Baker, Liz Sladen, Ian Marta, Davros, Zygons, Wirren, you know, Pyramids. That's 
that's you know how could i not be a doctor who fan you know growing up through that so pretty exciting my... times what a memory to be seared into into your brain yeah. fantastic yeah. so i think fantastic. i had no choice to be a doctor who fan mm. see we can say giant giant spiders from australia we look at them and we go they're not spiders <laughs> <laughs> they're not giant they're not spiders they're not yeah. giant spiders yeah, this, this, yeah, we have the giant spies in our bathrooms, but they're not giant. Your hardcore, right. you're straight. We're going to go a little bit more in depth with you in a minute about your, I guess, your fan journey, your career, and eventually becoming a companion to the Doctor. But before we do that, Philip, do you know what? Yeah. You do? Oh, <laughs> come on, be a bit more surprised. We're going to jump down the rabbit hole. Let's go. <laughs> Don't encourage him, Conrad. <laughs> We're here. We're here, Conrad. Okay. You can stop now. Okay. Nice. All right. Here's my question, and it always goes without notice whatsoever to Philip. It's just a simple We've got question. Really. I'm happy for, you can send to the guest first if you want to. No, 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 no. It's got to be you. <laughs> Thanks. What? It's a very simple question. What makes the perfect Doctor Who companion? Oh, dear. Um, female in a short skirt? No, no, that's the dad's answer. That's what John Nathan Twitter <laughs> thought. Um, okay, perfect Doctor Companion. <sighs> I think it's changed. I Actually, it's interesting. In some ways, it, it's it's become again what it started. So I think the perfect Doctor Companion was Barbara, originally. I think you had, because you had an older Doctor, um, I think Susan was supposed to be a way of seeing the universe, but she just didn't work. I think, unfortunately, for whatever reason, the writers didn't know how to write for her, so she wasn't the perfect companion. I think Barbara was the perfect companion. She was the point of view the audience had. She was skeptical but caring. She was inquisitive, and she trusted the Doctor. And in the end, just wanted to be there and just enjoyed life. And I think for a long time they lost what the perfect companion looked like and really rediscovered again, I think with, oh, I'm looking through, some ways with Rose. Rose was again created to be someone who actually wasn't equal to the Doctor, who gave the Doctor what's for. Um, I think Ace was a bit of a tr an attempt to be that sort of person, but she was still a child. And I guess, I guess Ace and Rose wasn't much different in age, but Rose was able to stand up for herself a bit more than Ace was. The, the Doctor wasn't trying to manipulate her and make her terrified. So for me, Perfect Companion, someone who trusts the Doctor, who loves the adventure, who is confident and strong in their own right, um, inquisitive, and occasionally just needs to be rescued, but also can do the rescuing. So those are the sort of qualities off the top of my head I'd be looking for. And I think we have had lots of them through the way, and... Some have been better written than others. Some, some like Elizabeth Sladen. I, I think Sarah Jane wouldn't have been anything like as good as she would have would have been without an actress like Elizabeth Sladen making every line sing and taking plain lines and making them exciting. Um, I think Graham did the same thing in the Jodie Whittaker era. Graham was spectacular with every line that he had, and no matter how bad the material was, you noticed him. Um, but then other characters have been lucky just to have. There's some interesting things, but often depends on the writer. I mean, you know, Leela, amazing character on paper, works so well with, you know, for the first three stories, and four, first four stories in particular. And then she just became a generic, you know, we'll just kind of make a scream, which Louise fought against. And so I think saved the character in some parts. Um, can I just say, I love all the companions. And then, you know, in, in, in terms of audio, I mean, I think, you know, you know, Charlie's my favorite companion on audio. And always has been. I think Charlie was just the perfect character for the Doctor. She just created so well for Paul McGann. Brilliantly played by an amazing actress in India. Um, she had compassion and sympathy and just a joy of life. And I, I wanted to be there with her. So I think a good companion you want to be with, with them and spend time with them. Conrad, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I think I can beat that, but I think the only thing I'd add to that, I think, is is because my, my I think like you hit a lot of the points of my, some of my favourite companions. Like I do genuinely, especially in classic era, love them all. For me, po high points are just sort of like Barbara, uh, Sarah Jane, obviously, 
uh, Ace, I, I really love, and in the new series Rose, and I would also just on an, in an unbiased way also say Charlie. I, I've always said that. I think she, it's there's something about all of those people, and obviously it's the actors who bring have brought those actors so much to life. But I think another quality I'd add to it is sort of a flexibility and adaptability with not only the Doctor, but if but the lead man you're playing with. You need to be, in both cases, you need, need to be able to understand, to step back when they're having a big, and let them have a big moment, or know when to challenge them, or know when to say, no, Doctor, you're being an idiot, we're supposed to be doing this, or knowing when to sort of stand back and look pretty and ask questions um and it actually that counts for both on screen and off screen because there's a as maybe we'll get into there's that there's an awful lot of blur between those things so i'd say everything philip said and i'd say flexibility and adaptability as well yeah i i agree with what you said too philip uh particularly with barbara but i would also add ian to that because he i, I think he balances um what the companion can be for for different people because Ian was was the was the action man he was designed that way Barbara was the compassionate person um, so I think yeah they they were always my favorite of the of the first Doctor era those two I mean I, I love Ian I love Ian I love Ian as well but I think Ian often opposes the Doctor. Is Barbara's job to be the go between between the two of them and to bring them back together again? So yeah, but I mean yeah, he, for plot plot wise, he's great. I mean, there's there's not actually there's not a TV companion I don't like. So even Dodo, I think, he, I think even Dodo who gets gets the worst stick of anyone. Um, I can actually see some great qualities in her, and I think in the Gunfighters she's amazing. I was going to say he, Gunfighters is yeah top of the list she's for Dodo in, yeah. the, in the Gunfighters. Yeah. Um, just roughly, roughly, roughly treated, and there's only a couple of audio companions I just don't think works. And yeah, and we, well, one of the non big finished companions we talked about last night, which will come up sometime. Um, yeah, but on the whole, yeah, I, I, on the whole, they're really well written by across the board because people know what we need, but some, some are able to carry a bit more with them, and that's usually through. Either good writing, well, both good writing and good performances. Some some performers can just get themselves up, even with with ordinary writing, but some companions just have amazing writing and amazing performances, and then they just flow. I mean, you know, Catherine Tate's another one. I mean, you know, she's just amazing what she she can do too, and a very different sort of companion to what we were getting with Rose and Rose and um, Martha to start off with. It's amazing how they got it so right with. Barbara Wright and and, the, and Jacqueline Hill is like how could you get pretty much the best companion one of the arguably the best if someone says Barbara's the best companion you kind of can't really argue if you don't even if you don't agree but how to get us so, in sixty years how to get it so absolutely right on the first go that's sort yeah. of astonishing how they did that yeah and, and, and Jacqueline and, Hill it's and, and just... obviously viewed as being I mean you know she's a mate you know, um Jack, Jacqueline Hill. Um, you know, she's just happy to be the best friend of the producer who said, I think Jackie would be good for this. <laughs> and, you know, she didn't have to go through the whole audition process that other people went through, but just, you know, sort of pulled out through nepotism, um, still paid half of what um, William Russell was paid, mind you. Um, you know, being a woman, why, why would you pay the same as William Russell? Um, but yeah, carries carries so much of the show for those early years, and it's just the, the high point for, for two years. Perhaps, perhaps my question what makes the perfect companion makes you think too much about looking for one or two of, but there are yeah. so many over, over the years and it's the different relationships between the different characters that make magic. Like you, you referred to um, Sarah Jane Smith, but skipped over Joe Grant. So there's, there's Sarah Jane is interesting because she crossed over between the more human third doctor and the more alien fourth doctor. So there's that crossover there. But throughout the Joe Grant years, we had this really warm, caring relationship. It was, it was very human. Whereas you, then you go to the fourth Doctor Romani, you've got that almost alien relationship, uh, which is a different dynamic once again. But then Romana decides to go and regenerate and it becomes a lot more friendly for, oh, for more reasons than one, I guess. Um, but... Yeah, there are so many different dynamics 
uh, for, for, for the different doctors' personalities as well. I mean, think about Colin Baker and his personality, how he was when he first regenerated, very cold, very snappy. And then his companions throughout his time, especially Big Finish, and we, we haven't mentioned uh, Evelyn yet. She's probably my favorite Big Finish, uh, uh, Big Finish companion. Um, she brought something that really softened the, the Sixth Doctor to the point where he's like he was starting to soften you could tell on television in mysterious planet when he, he and perry were really softening from that previous season um but by the time evelyn came along softened him right up and then he was a different person almost within that one regeneration he was several different people so very interesting the way these companions can can even soften a doctor and it might have even happened with Capaldi as well. He started off very hard and he, he kind of softened and was a different person again with Bill at the end. And and uh, we got the, all these different variations of the same Doctor. Don't know what you guys think of that. Yeah, I, I think just on your earlier point, I think in part what we like in people is of what we look for in the companion. So for, I think Joe, I, think, I do think Joe and the third Doctor were lovely together and I still cry at the Green Death when she leaves. But it was very much a she was a, in a being protected relationship. He was there to protect and look after her and, and that, which I think worked well. I mean, I think I probably preferred Liz Shaw, to be perfectly honest, because Liz was smart, intelligent, strong willed, didn't need saving, where Joe did need that protection. And I think naturally John Pertry gives that sort of protection and that, that hug. But why I'm more attracted to Sarah Jane Smith is because she was a lot feistier and strong and independent, which is, if, if I'm looking for, who do I want my daughters to be? Daughters to be, I want them to be like Sarah Jane more than Joe Grant. Now, do I love Joe Grant's companion? Yes. Do I think you know, I love Kenny Manning? I do. Um, but in terms of who do I want my daughters to be, I'd like them to be more like Sarah Jane, or I'd like them to be more like Rose. So I guess I'm I'm looking in terms of what are the characteristics I want to see in my daughters, and so those are the sort of I think are the things that appeal to me the most. But yeah, you are right. The, the, the interplay with Doctor and Companion is really important. And, and yeah, you think of Doctors, you think of the Companion with them. Um, so with the first Doctor, I think you do think of Ian and Barbara. Like, I do think they come as a set. Um, you know, second Doctor's Jamie, third Doctor's Joe, fourth Doctor, probably Sarah Jane. Um, but then he's, yeah, he actually has a huge bag, doesn't he? Um, Tegan for the fifth, um, Perry for the sixth, um, ace for the seventh so they've all got their sets that go together um, and that's yes it, they certainly do help define who the doctor is and i think that's a good point Dwayne. you said about that you know that the, obviously the doctor change of can change so they're a completely different person from one to the next but like you said he also changes or she he or she also changes throughout their run and also they change scene by scene or even mid scene they'll change so it's like loyalty i'd add to that because you have to love that person or at least be loyal to them to deal with that level of bs on a sort of, you know of just them being so changeable there's gonna be something at the core you believe in because they can be a nightmare one minute and your best friend the next so yeah yeah loyalty i'd add to that absolutely true anything left that we haven't covered on companions oh there's tons we've left that we haven't covered but yeah conrad a great outfit a weird outfit, a uniform, you know, if you do it, you're rocking a uniform and you want to wear that for three years, you rock that. If you're fancy, you know, if you're from the Victorian era and you want to have a go at a mini skirt, you crack on, you know, just wear some, even if you want your kilt. dumb maths badge, math badge, kilt, just wear some, wear some mad stuff. You've got the TARDIS wardrobe, you're in time and space, we wear what you freaking like. So yeah, a, a, a crazy, kooky, sometimes sexy costume. I was going you to say, yes. Yeah, what, so... what we got up to in that, that, that TARDIS wardrobe room. You don't want to know. The yeah, I want, I want to know what you were wearing later. <laughs> don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, because the Doctor doesn't doesn't use that wardrobe too much, although he may do soon, judging by the pictures that we've seen. Eh? Mm. So that could be interesting, an interesting change of direction. All right. I think on that note, did you want to say something else, Conrad? No, I'm good. I'm just really excited to have done a rabbit hole. I'm thrilled. I love that. <laughs> I feel like I made it. Awesome. All right. Well, let's crawl up out of the rabbit hole. And before we uh, talk to you further, uh, let's throw in the trailer for The Creed of the Cromen, because as I said, in January 2024, it will be 20 years since that story has been released. Doctor Who, The Creed of the Cromon. 
I will not speak. I will not say what I've seen. I ask only that you don't harm Lyda. Lyda, captured. Median 5. Selected at induction for reproductive reserve. Status confirmed. Ingested first and second rate Q elixir. Hybridization experiment promising. Advanced to status Q3. So I wonder where we are. Well, the landscape seems the same as we saw earlier. Yeah, dry and dusty. Blech. Why wouldn't the croaker let us through? What's to hide? There must be life somewhere. There must be technological development. The croaker seemed interested in the TARDIS. We can worry about his interest when we find the old girl. Oh, I, I was inducted, taken with Lyda to Alphasphere. Well, there were hundreds of us. We were graded, assessed for work and usefulness, divided into groups. Everyone was herded away until only Lyda and I were left. Are the Crummen native to this zone? Oh, no, they're not like us. You will all remain standing. You will wait for the return of the patrol ship. You will be taken to the Alpha Sphere for interrogation and induction. And if we refuse? You have zero choice in the matter. Ingested final expansion, Lixia. Consumption successful. End of requested information. We're not your enemy, Garys. Please believe that. Um, I'm not going to read his comment. We've been stuck with him for the whole show so far because he wanted to come into the rabbit hole, which has been great to have you so far. Um, I want to take you back, back to Titanic. No, uh, let's go back to wh where were you born? Where did you grow up? Let's give, tell us a bit about your early years, Conrad. Yeah, I was born um, in a place called Hawley, which is near London, just outside London. But I grew up in big inverted commas um, in the West Country um, in a little city called Wells. And it's only a city because it's got a cathedral in it. But basically, it's one of those, you know, chocolate boxy, Miss Marpley kind of, you know, morning vicar, you know, Mr. Bun the Baker, Mrs. Sparks, the electrician's wife, you know, a nice little cosy chocolate box, English, what would be a town, but is a, is a a city and I kind of I grew up there and um I was very very happy you know I just I think I had a really happy childhood and a lot of it was to do with the fact I had a really I, I was very into Doctor Who and Star Wars and Batman and cartoons and all that kind of stuff and I've just had a very I've always had like a really sort of strong relationship a very healthy relationship with my fantasy life and later on that door so I think when things started coming along later that I was in or got involved in, it was always sort of fairly natural to me that there was this two way door. I always sort of assumed that I didn't, I never, I never really kind of got the, got a grip between the separation of reality and fantasy. So yeah, but yeah, I had a very, very, very happy upbringing. Doc, and Doctor Who was a big part of that, I think. Do you feel you've missed out on your creative side by not having this tortured childhood that you needed to, to, to be really creative and explore yourself? <laughs> no, that came later. The, 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 the torture, despair, and all of that. Don't worry, I had my fair share of plenty of that in adult, adult life, but I was a relatively happy childhood, thank goodness. I think it's part of, um, you mentioned before your age, um, I've been to a lot of 21st and 50th in the last 12 months or so. And it's interesting this speech is the 21st are always about hope and what the future holds. And by the 50th is all about, well, we've managed to get to this point, aren't we? Lucky we've survived. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you wake up in the morning, check your pulse, go, <laughs> yeah, we're good. It's still good. Um, you mentioned before your love of Doctor Who. When did you decide that you were going to be an actor? When, when, did, when did the whole creative side take hold, and how? Yeah, I was in. It was when I was at a, when I was actually really little, and I had to go from I think what was infants to junior school, which had been like six to seven. The reason I didn't want to go to junior school is because they did plays, and I thought that was really scary. And then the first time they did a play, like a nativity or something, they're like, "Who wants to be in the chorus?" And I was like, "Put my hand up," because I was like, "Great, I can hide in the background." And they just went along and went, mm, no, we need lead, the lead person. In, you know, like, you're cute. Come to, come to the front. You're, you're the lead person. I was like, having said I didn't want to be in it at all and be in the chorus, they just shoved me out the front. And I had a go at that and I quite liked it. But then um, when I went to, when I was a teenager and I went to comprehensive school, we had a really, really excellent drama teacher. Or like a, one of those teachers that really made a difference and really made it called Mr. Wild. What a great name, Mr. Wild. Um, and you can actually see Mr. Wild in the film Hot Fuzz, which was all filmed, the Simon Pegg uh, movie, and it was all filmed around Wells, where I grew up. And there's a little, and because um, Edgar Wright, now I think about it, he was two years below me 
in school. So he had the same teachers and all that kind of stuff. So Mr. Wild was one of those drama teachers who just was brilliant. And I used to spend all of my lunch breaks and after school larking about with my mates in the drama thing. And we kind of ran the drama thing. And it really, it, it, it allowed me to kind of just play, get through school and deal with all that, the school stuff. I, I kind of was probably a bit of a late developer in, and I was able to just play and sort of have a bit of an extended childhood. And so at school, I was re- I got through school pretty well. And, you know, especially like being gay as well, you've all got that to deal with. But actually I felt very happy and protected because I was like, we were like, come on guys, let's paint a set. Let's do that. You're probably really obnoxious, but we were always like, come on guys, let's put on a show. And that was us all through school. But at the same time, Mr. Wild was really strict. He was terrifying. Like everyone was terrified of him. I wasn't because we were doing drama. So it was good. But he, I didn't really realize until I did stuff professionally later that he was actually teaching us the discipline. It's not all larking about and fun, or rather, the more fun and creativity you want. The, the more rigid your boundaries, the more professional you've got to be, the more on time you've got to be, you don't piss about. It's very, very... So he was brilliant. So I think that's that really instilled it in me. And then when I by the time I kind of got to late teens, you know, you're trying to be all serious and sensible. So I kind of, I packed it in uh, and then sort of went off and did other stuff, went to university and stuff. Did you have any musical influences um, or yeah. tastes? Yeah. It's funny, my t- I talk about my childhood being very happy and very formative. And I think if you'd have asked me when I was a kid or at school, what's your favourite programme, film and music? I would have said Doctor Who, Star Wars and Kate Bush. And if you ask me now, what's your favourite programme, film and music? You know, it's the same. Um, and it, like, it's, I'm just lucky that those things which could have lasted three or five years just happened to have lasted decades well not happened they're all really excellent um so yeah they're my key tastes they always have been and i don't think i've ever changed them i mean maybe that makes me very limited or whatever but i just think i have phenomenally good taste at an early age well it's funny because i i have always been since childhood doctor who star wars abba and would still still hasn't changed in 50 years amazing i'm hoping to see the the, the show the abba show uh, later this year because brendan jones from flight through entirety is coming over to the uk and i think he's going so i might try and see if i can join him and go to that i'm planning to fly over there just to see it i've had a friend go over and see it three times if i come from australia three times to go see it so yes it's it's on my um bucket list hopefully next year that's my plan um you just mentioned before in terms of your, your sexuality in terms of being in high school um in in terms of what at what point did you did you understand that you were gay and what influence did that play in terms of your loves of Doctor Who or theatre, etc.? Was that a major influence? There's some big questions right there. Like, I think in terms of when I had a sense of what my sexuality actually was, it's the same time as everyone else's, like normal development, 12, you know, between 11, 13, 14, you're kind of going, you know, you kind of know what's going on. Um so that's when I had a where you know I, I had my sexuality the same as time as everyone else. But like everybody else, I can track back from when I was tiny, and I can see my attitudes towards gender, like men and women, and think the things I liked. It's it's kind of amazing how early that's formed, and and it and it, it comes at you in a different way. But there's just like this sounds so freaking corny, but you know how it's such a a. Um, a cliche they're like oh gay men like wizard of oz and judy garland and all that kind of stuff it's like yeah it is a cliche but when i was like three or four when i saw that i was like something about that just beams so certain things i also sort of like gayness and campness and that kind of stuff is like a frequency that only some people can kind of hear or get and some things like the wizard of oz just beam straight in there it's like i could leave my home and go off to a big colorful technicolor world with my friends something about this speaks to me and there are cert- but there are certain certainly formative influences and i've always said you can see like there's a batman thing over there batman 66 that was incredibly formative i won't go too far into that but uh i've i've actually been quite curious about i'm very curious about stuff like sexuality and psychology so i've actually gone back and really tried to retrace where all of these these influences came from that was certainly a thing where it wasn't i'm i'm understanding this in a sexual way cuz i was 6 or 7 but something about that like made sense in my brain and continued to make sense and it was often like the villains like this but this like bunch of this this freak show of these weirdos i'm like yeah i like you lot you know it's like there's something about you 
I think it's because quite quickly you realize that you're different and the adult world that's being presented to you is not, isn't quite something about it doesn't ring true. So I think gay and queer people have a sense of the uncanny or what's behind that curtain or that there's something else going on that's that that the adult world isn't quite right which i think is why huge generalization i think gay and queer people are often attack uh, often very attracted to sort of what appear to be frivolous or surface or artificial things is because they have an innate sense of spotting what's real or what's behind a sort of curtain i think that's a that's a key thing also, when I was, I think when I was nine, Flash Gordon came out in 1980. And if you see Flash Gordon, you're going to come out knowing which side you're on. Because that is a very, <laughs> there's something for, there's something for everybody in that film. You know what I'm talking about. I do know what you're talking about. All the about. straight boys are thinking, hmm, Princess Aura. And all the, all the you know, anyone who likes men is thinking, hmm, Sam Jones and other shorts. That film is a sorter. If you're a kid or if you're not sure about your sexuality, pop on Flash Gordon 1980 and you'll be very clear by the end of it. <laughs> now, early on, I mean, part of the reason why I'm racist, early on you talk about the, the gay kid in the, in the drama room. Were you out and comfortable as, in, in school or was it still something that was mm. hidden? Did, no, did it's, your friends know? Was, no, it's a totally different era. So I was, you know, while I was sort of just being me, you know, just like a just sort of happy, <laughs> happy kid. Um, it wasn't really, I think there was one kid who was out at school. And he obviously had a ho- horrible time of it. I was still kind of a bit unsure. It was a different time. And also it was it was the 80s. And I mean, any discussion of being gay was just linked to AIDS, where you had these terrifying adverts coming out. So no, I, I didn't actually come out, come out until I was like 21 or something when I went to university. And that seems very, very late now, maybe. But back then, it was sort of appropriate. Like I said, I sort of had an extended childhood and didn't really... I think, you know, I did, I started to experiment and stuff happened, you know, mid teens, I started to to get a bit of action here and there, but um, I didn't really come out now until I went to university. Okay. Do you think your sexuality has played a part in terms of career choice and where you've headed? As much as anyone else's, yeah. um, okay. you know, like I can ask a straight person, like what, what being about heterosexual led you to being a bank manager? You know, like it's very hard, it's kind of hard to, to separate, but um, I think, it, you know, there is a long tradition of, you know, gay people being very artistic or very creative. I don't know why that is. We're drawn to, like I said, it's part of that explanation is I think, oh yeah, we know how to play in a fantasy world. We know what we can see behind the curtain. We, we, the, the game's up. We know this is one big bloody play and it isn't real. Whereas I think if you're straight, it's much easier to, to accept, you know, the, the, the world that's being presented to you, you know, men, women, marriage, kids, da, da, da. It's a very, it's very congruent with your parents' life, their, your grandparents' life, your life. And so I think it, I think there's less need to look outside that structure. Whereas I think if you're you're queer, pretty you you learn you learn pretty quick, and also you've got to lie and hide, and you've got to learn all kinds of skills. Like in 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 class, you've got to learn how to be invisible. If if some subject comes up about being gay, you just learn how to sort of shimmer out and be invisible, or you learn how to adapt how you talk or modulate your voice or, or your wrist. You know, like you have you learn very quickly how to be a bit of a I also like being gay is like a superpower. You, you know, it's a bit of a curse. It's a bit of a blessing, but you do learn certain modes. You learn very, at a very young age that you have to adapt. You can't just be the person people want you to be. You've got to have alter egos and fantasy lives and you have to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think my sexuality probably is involved in, in my creativity to that respect. Cause I think gay people know they've been play acting for a long time. They've had to. So so after school, you go to university, or how how do you get into acting from there? What 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 is your plan for life? What was your ten year plan when you left school? Okay, I'm I'm sort of in my early twenties, you know, in the nineties, so I haven't got a clue what's going on. Um, but I went to university. I did communications, which now is quite common, but then it was quite an unusual hybrid of like psychology, sociology, with also film studies and TV studies and all that jazz. Moved to London, um, and my first proper job was. I didn't have any plan, but I moved to London and my first proper, proper job is I work for 20th Century Fox. And as, as I'll probably sort of will keep coming up as a bit of a running theme, as I've, I've sort of realised, is that I'm incredibly lucky. I don't know why cool stuff just seems to happen to me without me really trying too hard. So that's nice. Um, I was on the I was I was working in a shop. I was working at Harrods. It was ridiculous. Um, but 
one of the suppliers phoned me at one time and we were just chatting and he went, um, oh, did you see that Princess Diana interview on Par- Panorama, the big Princess Di interview? And I was like, no, I was watching this other thing, this new show called The X-Files, which I really love. And he's like, oh, I've got a friend who's, who's involved in that. And I just went, oh, he hasn't got any jobs, has he? Half joking. And he went, yeah, I think he has actually. I'll put you in touch. And it turned out that the 20th Century Fox was were opening an office in Soho Square to do all the licensing and merchandising. So I did a bit of research on the early internet. I had to use my dad's internet to look up X Files merchandise. And I, I, I sort of I found a cut. I saw a couple of really cool uh, light up X watch by a company called Wesco, who I think did Doctor Who clocks and watches. And in the interview, he was like, do you know about the X-Files? And I was like, genuinely, I do. I know all about the X-Files. And I said, yeah, I've very cool merchandise. I love this watch. And this guy went, I designed it. I designed it. And I think I had the job. So it's one of those little, see, I say I'm lucky, but actually that's a little bit of research and a little bit of making your own luck. But so I worked at 20th Century Fox in my early 20s, which was a dream come true. We worked on The Simpsons, Buffy, X-Files. And it was around the time stuff like Baz Luhrmann, like Romeo and Juliet, titanic you know it was it was amazing i mean i was working in soho square and basically all day long i was just playing with toys and approving simpsons merchandise and going to movie premieres down the road it was like amazing i've got to tell you this ridiculous story because this 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 shows you how ridiculous it was like you always had to keep a tux on the on the coat stand because if there was a someone like someone they'd always be like oh there's tickets tonight there's spare tickets to a premiere down the road you're like tuck stuff you're down the road but i remember one time it was around the time of the star wars re-releases you know when they did the yep. special editions whatever you call them at the cinema and uh the pr guy came to me in a massive panic and he had two big trunks and he was like you know you've got to help me you've got to help me you like star wars and i was like yeah and he said there's a premiere tonight george lucas is coming there's the original darth vader costume and there's a replica one and I've got them mixed up and I don't know which is which. Can you help me? And he yeah. said, George, George Lucas is coming. There's a big walk down with stormtroopers. George, you've got to help me. And I was like, okay, wait, wait, I got this. And I looked and I sort of circled these boxes. I picked up the helmets and did this. And I was just like, mm. I was like, yeah, definitely, definitely that one. He's like, thank God you're a lifesaver and ran off. I was like, I had no idea. I just wanted him to have an easy time. I'm like, George Lucas is going to be too busy. Nobody cares. But like, that's the level of crazy. Very, very fun. But then one day... I was, someone said, oh, do you want to see the films we've got, Fox has got coming up for the next couple of years? And I was like, sure. And I li- looked through this, uh, flicked through this, this spreadsheet, and I was like, oh, you know, Aliens, new Aliens movie. Oh, right, a new animated movie, cool. And then as the years went by, the 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 slots, the film's titles stopped happening. And then it was just like, Valentine's Day, chick flick, summer, animated film, Christmas, some comedy. And I and I knew, you know, you don't work for a big Rupert Murdoch company without knowing you're just there to make money. But seeing it so boldly that, like, these people don't care about films at all. They're, they've got no idea. They just and I think just seeing it just really made me very disillusioned. And it was just a moment where I was like, and I, and I think in a corporate environment, I don't think I'd last that long anyway. So I probably lasted three years, and I was like. I hate this. I hate this. I now hate this job. And I, I just need to go somewhere else. So basically, I, I did a bit of soul searching and then I bugged off to drama school um, quite late, lots of late 20s or something. Yeah, I went off to well, off to drama school uh, for two years. So that's how I got there. So what was that experience like? Yeah, well, it depends which drama school you went to. I went to a place called The Poor School. It's not that well known. It was near, near King's Cross. It was known for being very rough and ready. It churned out a lot of EastEnders. I think um, Jessie Wallace, if that's still her name, uh, she went, like she was the year above me. There were lo- a load of EastEnders around. It, it kind of t- turned out kind of the reputation was for very hard work in actors because it was incredibly tough. It was mm-hmm. probably the the hard, the toughest I've worked, I think. Two solid years. Thirty six of us started. Sixteen of us made it. It was wow. you're, you're basically you were learning. And again, this is what I was talking about the, the discipline you learn from school. You just like you're never you're like you're never late. You're never ill. If you if you're thinking of being ill, I want to speak to the who's in charge of the hospital bed you're in. Like you can't do that on stage. You can't be late. You can't be ill. So you're not going to be. And so it was really and it was very strict. And it, the guy who ran it was a brilliant, nasty alcoholic. And so, you know, you got swore at, shouted at. It was hideous. Um, but it was also the most wonderful experience. So it was very tough. So it was, I was really kind of grateful for that. And I, and I was able to deal with it. So I, I did that for two years and it was it was fantastic. And then I came out of that in my early 30s with a completely blank CV. And I'm like, geez, I'm 30. And my, you know, because I'd start, I'd rechange career. And I had a, an empty CV and I had to start from scratch doing 
plays. I only really wanted to do theatre. That's all I ever really wanted to do. And so you're doing like, like things for like no money above a pub, you know, new right, cl- the classic stuff. And then just sort of built up as you do. And, and you sort of, you know, you, 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 your next job's a bit better then your next job's a bit better. And then someone rehires you and then you get an agent and then you, then it kind of builds up. Um, I mean, yeah. And then I think my first professional job, what I would call professional, um, was a tour of Abigail's Party. It was the 25th anniversary tour of Abigail's Party at Hampstead Theatre. And I was understudying, but I was covering this wonderful guy called Stefan Rodri. He's an amazing actor. And what a lovely guy. He said, um, I think I might be feeling a cold coming on that might be coming on on Monday if you uh, want to go on. And I was like, oh, what a shame. I hope you feel better after Monday. So I knew I was going to get to one. So bless him. He just he just sort of took a dive and let me have a night on stage. And it was amazing. And that that's like that that does something different to you when you're in a proper production of something, big audience in a proper theater, and you're getting a big laugh. That kind of stuff is like, oh, oh, I like this. And playing my paid part of Tony and playing my wife was one little unknown called Lizzie Hopley. Whatever happened to her? I always keep meaning to ask. Yes, I don't know what happened to her. Yeah. So that was, and that, and that kind of, you know, that put, I don't know, then things started to take off. And, you know, obviously I've been friends with Lizzie ever since. So, and and, and then from then, yeah, then I'm looking for like good, proper stuff. And then then you're up a level and you just have to drag yourself up a level each time. Um. And yeah, and, and basically I think, uh, so I did, I trained for two years and I acted for 10 years uh, and and it was brilliant. It was really hard work. I really, enjoy, I really loved it because I'd made it myself. You know, there's a total blank CV. And then, you know, you get into the back of the taxi one day and the guy goes, oh, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I suppose I'm an actor. And then you, then you are. And just because you say you are, you kind of create it and then you are. And I did lots of theatre. I did lots of Shakespeare. I did lots of physical theatre. There was a sort of phase I went through doing a lot of very, very f- lot of work with amazing physical theatre companies like frantic assembly and punch drunk and adventures in motion pictures and i loved all that stuff and then a very big shakespeare phase which i i loved which culminated in in doing a a romeo and juliet at the globe which was just like wow if you want to do theater and if you always like shakespeare and i remember mr wilde took me to see my first shakespeare play you know and so like if you want if you like acting and you like theater and then you find yourself at the globe you know, on your own, on stage, 2,000 people, and they call it the globe because it's a circle. And and when you're on stage, there's people as high up as you can see, as far left as you can see, as far right as you can see. And then you look down and there's people like that, you know, looking looking up at uh, you. So so all the world's a stage. And it was like, you know, a laugh, getting a laugh or response in that big wooden space. That's a that's a very nice feeling. And we toured it all, all around Europe, all these Shakespeare festivals. And that was real highlight. But I think that slightly scratched an itch in me because nothing was ever the same after that. I did. I was still working, still getting parts, but I'm, I was like, something's not here. And I think, really, really honestly, I, I think part part of me was just like, I, I can't, I can't beat that. It, it, in my something in my heart just was like, after that, I wasn't really. So, I don't know. My, my heart wasn't in, in it. Heart wasn't as in it as much after that. And you can't do acting if your heart's not in it. So. No. Uh, I saw tw- I saw Twelfth Night at the Globe, and it was just the most amazing experience. And yeah, as as part of the audience, it was an amazing experience. So I can imagine being on stage must be an amazing buzz. Yeah, well, you're into the, another, another beauty of the Globe is that it's sort of you're all there's no lighting in there. You're lit. Yeah. You're all lit by the same light, so that you can see them, they can see you. It's a very, very, very kind of two way thing. So it's it's not so removed and you know you're always talking to the audience or if there's a plane in the sky you refer to it it's it's you know it's brilliant if, they, if they're being rained on you're being rained on it's all it's brilliant <laughs> all one so in yeah. 2003 february you went and recorded your first big finish so how did you come to work for big finish yeah through so through a series of again happy accidents and me not pushing too far i think socially i in the early 2000s i met clayton hickman um and obviously he was the ed- editor of doc two magazine um we were chatting and he was like, oh, I'm going to um, um, a convention in Manchester, Monopticon. And he was like, oh, you should come. And I was just like, OK. And then I, I went. And when I arrived, he was like, oh, you came. I was like, yeah, you said I should. So I'm here. Um, and then I just sort of um, met lots of people and it was all good. And then they were looking for a new assistant editor. And I think because I'd, I'd 
socialized with people and had a nice time. And, you know, I had the experience at Fox looking after brands and stuff like that. So basically I worked on Doctor Who magazine for six months and the acting work was there because this is 2003. So this is quite early. This is, I'd only been out of drama school a couple of years and it, I started to get age, uh, get auditions and stuff. So traveling from Tunbridge Wells just wasn't working. So I only lasted in Doctor Who magazine for six months. Um, and then I think as a bit of a leaving present, some dark deal was done at the Fitzroy Tavern. And I think they just chucked me a day on a Peter Davison audio, which is Omega, which I was just, I was like, this is, this is amazing. You know, this is, this again, this is early on, on in my career, but I was like, I'm going to be in Doctor Who for a day. And that's just, that's just amazing. And I didn't have to try or push or, you know, I, I'm not very ambitious in that way. Like I'm, I'm determined if there's something I want, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not looking to get places or make people do things or, or try and get in there. I've never been like that. Um, so it just landed in my lap and I was like, how jolly, I'm in dog tea for a day. So I really, I thought I'm going to make this count. So I hired a voice to, to, uh, tutor from my drama school. There's a direct friend I know. And I I just worked and worked and worked and worked on all of that. Even though it was just a one day and on audio, but I was like, I want this to be as good as I can make it at the time. And I'd never recorded an audio before. So I had to try and make that up as well. Um, and just uh, had a great day. You know, Peter Davison was there. Hugo Myatt, who was in a ki- uh, kid's TV show called Nightmare over here. Incredible. He was in my first scene. Um, and I was lucky because the character I played got to be possessed, got to, he got his hand lasered off. I had to play a young Rassilon, you know, be possessed by Omega, all this kind of stuff. So as an episode to be in, it was a good one because I got to do loads of stuff. And then I can't remember when it was, but some months later, I got a phone call from Gary saying, hey, we're looking for a new male companion for the eighth Doctor, Paul McGann. Would you like to do it? And, you know, I said, yes, please. And then I put the phone down and I jumped down, uh, jumped up and down on my bed for about 10 minutes going, hooray, hooray, hooray. Um, and then, yeah, that's what I got into. So it was actually only three months later because it's it? because although your next story to come out was The Grace, which wouldn't come out till the anniversary um, in November, you actually f- recorded all the next season with Paul McGann from May in May, and you wouldn't actually record the Grace until September. So you actually had, you actually recorded all your stuff as in, in in the May first for that next season before the Grace had been recorded. So say that again. So we so we do we did recorded the Grace after our first season. I can never remember when we did. Yes. That. So so you you recorded the Creator Cromanon, history Natural History of Fear, which we must talk about Twilight yep. Kingdom, and I think. Faith Stealer? Was that the four in that first? No, one? the Faith Stealer was the next one. I know that. Okay. So Twilight, Twilight Kingdom oh, was the Twilight last Kingdom one. Twilight Kingdom was the last one. That's right. Because yeah, there was, yeah. there's those four shirts, so you weren't in. That's right, no. of course. So there was that four was... in that season. Um, and they, they were all recorded in the May. And then they wouldn't actually record The Grace until September. Wow. So, they, so you, they brought you back first. So in terms of companion, what, what were you expecting? What were you told? Yeah, I didn't know much at all. Um, I, oh gosh, I'm just, I'm just trying to piece it together. So Gary made, made that phone call. I think between then and recording, Clayton Hickman had said, oh, you should meet India. And Paul was in a play in London. It, I think, the Riverside in Hammersmith. He was in a play with Susanna Harker. And Clayton said, let's have a, let's go out until you can meet uh India so I met India and, and we had a great we, we obviously clicked we just clicked absolutely instantly it was sort of I know it's a bit obnoxious actors are always like oh we're best friends it's all great does anyone um, not like, click with because anyone not yeah, click with India though so I mean I, I've met India and like she was sort of like best buddy within five minutes and That's everyone like, she was around she's suddenly best buddies with yeah India Fisher walks into a room or you hear her voice and you are in love with India Fisher yeah. it's just there's no option there's just no option um but we got on like really really well like we, we met at the tube station and by the time we were at the theater we were sort of arm in arm I remember the lights going down on the play and I said to her like god even if I'm not in a play I get really nervous and she was like you freak and I was like we've known each other for five minutes and I was like this is gonna be fine and um, we met Paul I met Paul very very briefly briefly at the end but I don't think he knew that this was happening and we didn't really chat and then it was really just dry. I think we got the scripts and then I was, Gary drove us down. It was me, India and Ian Farrington and just drove us down. And the only thing he said, he goes, we're not putting a voice effect on you, on you. I just want you to use your own voice. That was the only direction 
I had or asked for. Um, so I just had this, the words on the page to go from. And then I was just chucked in the studio. There was no big intro. He just said, oh, you know, I was have my scripts. Walked in. He's like, oh, Paul, this is Conrad. Like, hiya. And um, then Natural History Fear. I, did, I think we record, I think, did we record that one first? I'm going to have to ask you. Uh, I don't know which one we recorded, which order we recorded them in, but... Uh, uh, you recorded it was either natural- for 11th and 12th of May. Yeah. And the Queen of Croman was... It was either just before or just after. I 13th, 14th remember. of May. You are right. Yes, you did. That's, yeah, so I walk into the studio with just just said hello to Paul. So you, were, you weren't even your companion. You weren't even... Career's really no, that was my first. Uh, that was my first day. It was on Natural History for, for a couple of days, which was an amazing thing. But it was like very hard to establish a sense of our dynamic or my companion because we were all playing millions of different parts. But it was an amazing play to be in. Yeah, it, it's actually let's just briefly talk about. It. So, Natural History of Fear is um, without giving spoilers for that one. All of you are playing several characters going over and over through what seems like generations of time. And there's a reason behind it all, which is all revealed at the very end. But none of you actually are yourselves. No. Um, it is the most disturbing. It's a great play. And if you haven't, yeah, people who have ever listened to it, highly recommend it. It's really disturbing <laughs> um, what's going on there. But yeah, the, the issue there is, of course, that you know, your character is not your character. You're playing several roles. Yeah. Um and and yeah, very powerfully. So the first time you actually get to play who you are is the creed of Croman. Yeah. Um. At, at what stage did you realize you weren't human? You're were going to be an alien? Was that? Did Gary explain yeah. all that to you? No, I mean, I knew I knew I wasn't going to be an alien. He told me that, and and I had had the script, so I could see there was descriptions like, oh, you've got an, he, oh, he's got an exoskeleton. I was like, his eyes are like a cat's, and oh, he's changing color. I had as much clue as anybody else. I literally. Gary had said, you, you are an alien. I want you to use your own voice. And that is it. And that's all he told me. And that's all I asked for. I mean, I didn't I, I didn't ask more questions, which probably now I would have done. Um, so I just had the script to go on. So, yeah, I had natural history to go on. I was like, I still I have no idea who I am from that. Um, and then it was Creed of the Cromen. And it was, a, it was a very, you know, natural history is an amazing, amazing play. And while it was very disorientating to do... Um, I was aware it was something really incredible. And Paul loved it. He was so excited when that script turned up. And then it was Creed of the Cromen, which is a bit like going from Caves of Androzani to Twin Dilemma. Doctor Who does this to you sometimes. Um, I was very excited to be in a... It's better than that. (laughs) Okay. You know, it's... (laughs) uh yeah it's it's it was a tricky one to start on you know it was um i was very glad glad to be in a actually i've got to say one more thing about um natural history one vivid memory i have is someone had to come in and do a really difficult scene he had to come in really breathlessly and just ask loads of questions like millions and millions of questions like he was and we were talking over him it was really really difficult and we were also wondering god this dude how's he gonna do this and he did it because he walked in and he was sean carlson and it was on his first day and we were all looking at him because there's the studio up in, the, the setup in Bristol was quite odd. It was like you weren't in booths, you were in four corners. You were in the same room, just in four corners with Gary sitting cross legged on the floor. And he came in. And I remember when that scene came up, me, Paul, and India was like, How's he gonna, how's he gonna do this? He's gonna have to improvise all of these. He can't, it's not scripted. How's he gonna do it? And he just came in and did it. And it was phenomenal. And I remember Gary saying he was the find of the week. And we 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 went to the pub afterwards, we all got on with him, but I just need to drop that in because Sean Carson, we're still mates today, and I've got all the time in the world for him. But seeing him do that was that you know I'm learning about voice acting, and I saw him, and I was like, I want to be him, like him, please. You know, um, we'll talk to Sean. You can go listen to that episode for people listening. Go listen to Sean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sean Carson, he's amazing. Yeah, your interview it was great, great as well. Doctor Who: The Natural History of Fear. This is the voice of Light City. Attention. Welcome to your new workday. Today is Jubilee Day. Citizens may celebrate for one day without arrest or punishment. Happiness through acceptance. Welcome to your Jubilee Day. Welcome to your Jubilee. Do you worship? Do you go to church? Do you believe in God? How many gods are there? 
What's his name? What does he look like? Perhaps he's a woman, or perhaps he has a beard. Perhaps a, a, a bearded woman. Uh, perhaps he's he's many many gods, uh, a whole army of gods. Perhaps he's plotting to attack us now, to destroy us. A, a whole army of gods. Rampaging across a desert, a plateau, to kill us, to wipe us out. Would God do that? Is God fair? Does he love us? Does he hate us? Perhaps he's teasing with us, perhaps he's toying with us, perhaps he's playing with us, playing with our minds. Perhaps we're all just part of one big experiment. Perhaps we're just toys. Perhaps we're all little toy figures that God is playing with, and sometimes he bites off our heads, and sometimes he stamps on us, and sometimes he throws his toys back in the box, and he doesn't want to play with us anymore. He doesn't want us anymore. He wants to get rid of us. He wants to get rid of us, to throw us all away. Get rid of us. Don't do that to us. No, he loves us. He loves us, doesn't he? Doesn't he? It's true. Do we all love each other? Perhaps that's the answer. Love isn't that what we need? But then perhaps love is evil. Is it a sin to love? Is it a sin? Is it wrong? Is, is it wrong to love? To hate? Perhaps to hate is safer. Hmm? Or to feel nothing? Do we feel nothing? Do we feel nothing? Perhaps we'll be safer. We just feel nothing. And if we don't speak, perhaps we'll be safer. But yeah, then, then it was created the common, and like I was excited that it was uh, it was Philip Martin, so I was like, well, this has got the ring of truth. That like, I've got, I'll be. Comp- this is really nice to be able to say because I've only been able to say sort of promotional nice things about it at the time, sort of things in Doctor Who magazine. And to be honest, I'm also a Doctor Who fan, and I've got a brain in my head, and I know what a good Doctor Who story is like, and I know what a less good Doctor Who story is like. So I'm not a huge fan of Creed of the Common as a story. It's just not my kind of thing, but. It was where a lot of the clues, my initial clues from carriers came about. And, you know, some, you know, uh, you know, sometimes a part will leap off the page, as they say. He didn't lift, li- li- lift, like leap off the page at all. There were a lot of, there was a lot of contradictory information or, or just information that was quite hard to pull together. Um, he was a monk and very religious, but then also really hot headed and anti authority. He was, it came from sort of an agriculture. There's a talk about him being a farmer and this stuff. And then someone else describes him as being sort of, oh, we consider him like royalty. And there was a lot of, you know, he was kind of, I, I took some of the clue from the fact he changed colour. So I thought, well, that tells you he's more prey than predator. So that told me to sort of, he's a bit on the back foot. He's a bit gentle. He's a bit weird. He's, been, he's a bit unsure. But he's quite vulnerable. So I thought, I know that. I did try something once with the chameleon thing in that, quite early on in in Creed the Cromen where I thought the doctor says some says a word and Kerry's isn't familiar with it and he just repeats the word as in what? And I thought I'll do it like Paul does. I'll try and say it like Paul said it. Like a slight chameleon way, like he's trying to do it. And I think Paul, he might have just been surprised at hearing someone do his voice. I didn't think I don't know if he thought I was taking a piss or what, but he just shot me this look and I thought I just panicked I was like, I'm never doing that again. I'm literally never doing that again. <laughs> um so I think I lost a bit of that. And I just I think I've got very, as you can tell already, like I've got very mixed feelings about it um, because it was one of the most wonderful times of my life, but also it was very tricky. It was, I, 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 we, the whole, the era was getting very experimental. It was very difficult. The reception of it was, we'll talk about that, was very difficult. And I sort of struggled a bit to try and fit in. And I sort of defy anyone not to struggle to join Paul McGann and India Fisher, who were such individually their voices are amazing. Their chemistry is, I think, one of the best chemistry. It's like Sylvester and mm, and so it's incredible. And Gary was deliberately saying, you know, we've got a successful season under our belt, or a couple of seasons under our belt. We're going to just mix things up. And from Zagreus onwards, it was like whatever you think you're going to get, we're going to give you the opposite. And it was like very, very challenging. I was struggling, I think, to make that character fully work. And and being part of that dynamic is really key because it's, I think the the rationale was that Charlie and uh, the Doctor had one of the first proper love stories of any Doctor and companion. And you can't really, you know, carry that on. So let's bring in a third wheel, sort of interrupt it and be a bit of a gooseberry. And that's like a great idea, but it's quite hard to be that person, um, to be the, the, the scrappy-do. That's kind of... T- 
you know, I, you know, you were a kid. I hated Scrappy Doo. Like, no one, like, go away. You don't want a third person. So it was, it was honestly, I'm not sort of saying boo hoo me, but it, it was one of the challenges to come in as a third person, and not only in the characters but also the actors, sort of interrupt the flow a bit. And India and I got on incredibly well, and I think that's it. It start, it just changes the dynamic. You know, threes a crowd a little bit. So. I'm, I'm Kenny Smith, the big finish says that I'm always too hard on myself and I'm always too hard on the character and my part in it. So I've got to try and not do that. So I'll put that aside. So it, what I'm saying is I found it difficult, but you know, you learn and then, you know, scripts are good, scripts are bad and, and you find your own way. Let's talk about the, the fan reaction then, because I know personally speaking, I love the experimental stuff. I'm always into experimental. I'm up for experimental. Yes. I can think back to Creed of the Crumman and go, yeah, that was a difficult listen compared to the other stories of the season. But, you know, it always happens in Doctor Who, you'll get something that's a little bit more difficult than than something else. Did what what was the what was the feedback you were getting at the time from from fans? Was it a mix or was it was it was there more negative? It was part of a whole tsunami of a reaction that started with Zagreus, I think, because it's hard. It's, we, we've got to remember that back then, that was it was the newest Doctor Who ever. When you were walking to the studio, you were aware that the brand newest Doctor Who is on the words on the page is in my bag and we haven't said them yet. So there was a real sense of the newness of it and the anticipation, especially as there hadn't been a TV 30th thing particularly so the the weight i remember the expectation on zagreus was massive and when they pulled that massive u-turn like you know that gear change on that i think that rattled a lot of people and i think that carried on you know with the divergent universe and then throw you know like you're going to have doctor who with no tardis no daleks no monsters no time and this lovely dynamic you want we've now got we're now changing that so there was a lot of was it Gallifrey Brace or Outpost Gallifrey, which was first back in the day? Outpost Gallifrey was first. Outpost Gallifrey. So I was already seeing, and I was part of Outpost Gallifrey. So I was already, I already saw the a lot of the fan opinion generally at the time, and I was very much part of that. I was associated with being, you know, after Zagreus, there was that lovely two hand hander, and then we we're into this new thing. So I was just in the mix, and so. A lot of people criticised the whole thing, and then a lot of people really criticised me, the character, and also me, the way I did it. Um, and it was really rough. It was brutal. Like I'd, learned, you know, I'd done some theatre, and I, I kind of knew if you read a review, it's like reading someone's diary. You know, if you read, if you open that thing and read it, you get what you get. And um, you know, if your ego, if you believe the the nice ones, you've also got to believe the bad ones. So I know what reviews are like, but it still doesn't change the fact that that level of you know we know what doctor fans are like we know what we're like when we don't like something you know we savage it to bits and i was savage to bits and it really really hurt i can't lie um i had to lie because we had to do conventions and and interviews and doctor magazines and you know you know you always put on the, the nice sunny side of it no one wants to hear this stuff which is right it's really nice to get it out now are you, do i have, are you sending me an invoice for this afterwards is this therapy um <laughs> But yeah, yeah, there was a massive amount of criticism for the whole era and also for for the character and also for me, and it absolutely hurt like hell. But on the other side, you got lots of really lovely stuff because you started to do signings, conventions, and you got re- letters, letters to my home address that no one gave out. That was that was a moment. I'm like, what the hell? Um, lovely stuff, like delightful stuff, because then you start to meet people, and it was gorgeous as well but i can't lie it was very very mixed between like the most wonderful thing and the most hurtful stuff i've ever had in my life um i, I don't explore that a little bit more just in terms of i mean thank you for your honesty i mean uh, yeah i'm appreciating that a, a couple of months before the grace came out it was announced that a new series was coming back with Russell t davis yeah. So I think so i think that would have had an influence in terms of what was going on and it would have no doubt freaked out Big finish and Gary because he Gary had this big four five year plan and yeah. suddenly the show's coming back so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the effect that's going to have after another season or two of, of what's going on in the new series mm. we talked before in the, in the rabbit hole about what makes a good companion and it's interesting that the companions who've had the hardest time I think have the 
office introductions. So mm -hmm. as much as I talk about liking Dodo, she had a shocking introduction because they didn't know what they were going to do with her. And so mm -hmm. every story, they do something different with her accent, with her voice. And I think yeah. the fact that the actress is able to pull that off still, even though you know, every week she goes in with a new note about how to speak, how not to speak, how to what to wear, she somehow manages to pull it off. So we actually do see that in Gunfighters, we see she's a great actress. It could have worked if they just got it right. Um, I think Mel suffers from the same you know, the way they introduced her was just not a good way to introduce a companion. So if you introduced poorly, you struggle throughout. Um, you're in the situation where you have a, you're introduced in a, a season. Scherzo, which I adore, is an absolutely brilliant work. But that being said, polarized people, uh, you know, all, all really the Dr. Charlie relationship has polarized people. Can the doctor be in love? So Grace wasn't what people expected. And I'm, I'm, we talked to Gary about that soon. I'm really looking forward to that, that conversation um to see to take his take on on that i've got some um, i've got some great i've got some zagreus stories i got some stuff to tell you about zagreus okay well we might include that in the zagreus episode <laughs> um and they say you're introducing queen of Cromen, Krom which at the time it's, it's not clear that you will be a companion and if i'm right you kill your girlfriend it's yeah part of part of that which once again yeah. as, as a choice um as a choice for a new companions not the best of choices <laughs> probably to introduce a new companion with. You're then given what is an absolutely brilliant story and you were performing it amazingly, the history, history of fear, but that's not you, it's not the companion. And then you reappear in the Twilight Kingdom, which again, is a, I think it's a great story. That's Michael Keating, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's an unusual way to introduce a character. And I think that a lot of the issue isn't with you, it isn't with the character, it's just the introduction wasn't clear and so you get to the end of the season and we still don't have any idea really of who carries is what is about what his superpowers are um and from the sounds of it, you're not really clear either. The, the scripts haven't been clear i mean gary's using more experimental writers as well for that season and so all those things combined i think made it very hard for you yeah i mean i'm keen to take my responsibility for this and i think with a bit of maturity if i was to start something like that now I would just ask a lot more questions or just make bolder choices or not worry if Paul looked, looked at me funny if I did it. You know, I'd be I'd, there's a lot there was a lot of inexperience on my side. So I, I fully take my responsibility for, for, you know, the bits of that that didn't work or people that didn't like. But, yeah, it's um, now you put it like that. It, it was quite a quite a challenge to, to make all of that fly. But, you know, we but we got there. I think we sort of even though the the uh, um, the the arc was cut short, which which meant we never got a lot of the payoff. That there was, a lot of the stuff we set up never got paid off, so it was a bit tricky. But we did. We after a while we did get into our rhythm. Like Paul and India and I, like we often like the funny ones, or if there was a funny scene, like we all just cheered up and liked it. I think we, I think individually and together, we all just liked ones that were funny. Um, and we started to add put, put suggestions in and add libs in, and we got we got a bit of a relationship after a while. Um, and so, so, so we we kind of got there, but it was just a rocky, rocky start. I'd say. You must have loved Faith Stealer then, if you like the funny ones. You are absolutely on the money. I think. Don't tell the others. I think that's my favourite story, Dwayne. Bang on the money. I absolutely loved that, and I I had to listen to it for one of these extras the other day. And I don't, you know, you don't love listening to yourself, but you got to do it. And it really made me laugh. It's such a funny script. It's like we all loved it i can you can t you can hear paul is having fun indy's having fun i'm having a ball um i i, I think that's my favorite i thought i i'd like you can't make all of them all like that but we always loved the fun ones and i think that was something we got a lot of carries and a lot of that arc got a lot of trauma and a lot of tragedy and a lot of very bleak stuff but the stuff we always liked were you know just like so I remember a scene in I sorry to leap forward, but I remember seeing in Memory Lane where we're all eating ice creams, and I was like, "Well, he wouldn't know how to an ice cream, eat an ice cream, so he just shoves it in his mouth." And she's like, "You're not. You're supposed to lick it. Don't just shove it in your mouth at once." Like so, we were always like the funny ones and like things like Other Lives, the sort of bit of the fight that was outrageous, but the kind of farce element. But I really truly love Faith Stealer, and there's some amazing performances. Although I do tend to call it Show Stealer because there was one scene that we all watched and we were cracking up. Which was the Church of Whoops? Whoops or, be praised. Know, the, whoops be praised. That is so funny. John and, Dorney. And again, John Dorney's first appearance, and he came in, stole the show. Show stealer. 
It was his. It was hilarious. I listened to it the other day, and it still made me laugh. There are loads of gags in Face that are really, really clever gags. Um, I listened to your episode uh, with Chris Thompson um, about Face Dealer. Is it Chris Thompson? I think it is. He works at Eagle Moss. Yep. Um, That's my cousin. Re- <laughs> yeah. Is he your cousin? Oh, mate, well, yeah. you should know his name. Um, he, uh, he, you guys did an amazing review of Face Dealer, so please go and listen to that. Um, but yeah, I loved Face Dealer. It's sort of really funny, really witty, and it's a good Doctor Who story as well. Like, it's a really good. So, so again, so the start of the second series, I was like, with a bit of a break, coming back. Paul and India know who I am. I know who they are. We started to hit our stride a bit more with the stories like that, yeah. Doctor Who, Faith Stealer. Do your religions require ritual sacrifice, the drinking of blood, or any special diet? No. Carter, come on. A joke's a joke. Where are you? Where am I? Uh, hello? What is it? Are any of you carrying gods about your person? Uh, No, I I wonder, is all this uh, strictly de rigueur? I mean, couldn't we just pop inside and do the form filling some other time? Your faith and religious details must be recorded before you may enter the multi-heaven. Please, Bishop Parash, you must not struggle. You're... you're in my mind. It's the The less you fight it, the better it feels. What? What are you? I am Miraculite, and all shall live in me. Charlie and I are members of the tourist faith. We worship Keris here, and we begin each day with a ritual cup of tea. Your god's looking rather faint. Oh, God. Oh, Keris. What have they made you into? Kill me, please! All right. Goodbye, my love. This has to be. I was say, what was the atmosphere? Because it was June. So it's originally filmed in, recorded in May. You came back in September to do the Grace. Now it's June. So it's almost, it's a year, more than a year since you've done that first block of recording. Mm-hmm. What, what's it like coming back a year later to see that, you know, so just fall straight back into it? What's it? Yeah, a bit. Yeah. I mean, I was still the new boys. There were still little echoes of just trying to work out your position with, with the, you know, and again, you know, we, we do a lot of talking about the actual stories, but, you know, like the doc, you know, about the eighth doctor and Charlie, but a lot of it was like Paul and India and I trying to work out how we work. And, um, so there was a bit of confidence coming back to it. Cause you just have, sometimes if you just have a break from something and come back to it, you're, you're just better at it. Um, but we're, but at the same time, we are still trying to work out our way. And I like, I think Paul, I like, I, Paul is like a, one of the most incredible voice actors there is. He's incredible. He's very, very private. I don't think naturally we'd have been friends. And I think he was unsure about me. I think if I can put this in a shorthand, if you've seen like the collection sets and the interviews, I, I feel very much there's a lot of similarities actually between Tom and Paul. They're both from Liverpool. They're both absolutely, everybody loves them. Everyone knows there's two of the most amazing doctors ever. But I think when I hear Louise Jameson and Matthew Waterhouse talk about their experiences working with Tom, I'm nodding the whole way through. I'm going to leave that there. Um, so, you know, uh, we got on really, like we got, we got on really well. And we got on with the job really well, but there was just a large degree of uncertainty and yeah, I, I I completely I could see lots of echoes of like oh yeah. Do you think Paul? Do you think I mean? Well, firstly, what what was going on in terms of the universe with no time? Did you understand how you know? I don't think time anybody worked? does, and I don't think anybody. If if anyone says they understand the universe without time, they're lying. I don't really know what that means. I think even Gary said like I think the writers struggle to get to grips with it, and I'm like no 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 you know. No nonsense. <laughs> no, no surprise. No surprise there. You know, like, I love the divergent I, arc, but if there's any element, it's <laughs> that element that I struggle with the most. <laughs> so it's like what we do, if we if I go if I say, Doctor, we were in the TARDIS. Were well, what do you mean were? There's no such yeah. thing as time. It's like it's almost impossible to. It's. A, I think it's a really great idea. I just don't think. I, th- I think I agree with Gary that I think maybe 
the writers struggle to get to grips with it, but I, who can blame them? So um, was it Gary's concept? Was this, was the whole Divergent Universe Gary's baby? How, how did, do you know how it um, came about? No, it would have been part of, you know, this would have been discussed with Jason and Nick and I don't know exactly who. And I think Alan, of course, Alan Barnes had done Neverland, which led into, you know, anti-time and he was very central to Zagreus. So I think it was a just a direction. I think, And as I think Gary said... They just fell down a rabbit hole they couldn't get out of. Maybe. Who knows? But look, you know, I, I think, you know, if you've got a few, you've done a few successful seasons and people have liked it, I think it's a really healthy instinct to experiment. I mean... You, you know people talk about big finish now and, and you hear a lot of criticism that they're not experimenting enough and they're just doing sort of mix and match franchise stuff i don't other opinions are available these are not necessarily my opinions but like experimenting is good and if you can't experiment on audio where can you the thing about experiments sometimes they work sometimes they don't sometimes they're a bit of a mixture and i think this is one of those cases but i will always defend big finish's right to experiment i think it's a healthy thing to do with doctor who a healthy thing to do on audio but there were a lot, it just came at a certain time where there was a lot of stuff going on. So it was, it was really rocky. It was kind of, now I talk about it, it was kind of really exciting, but it was very rocky, very up and down. Like I, it was, for me, it was like major highs. You know, my new best friends are India Fisher and all this kind of stuff. And then major lows because you go online and everybody hates you. So it's sort of very rocky. I never hated you, Conrad. Thank you. That's <laughs> so, right. Absolutely not. Not everybody. That's for sure. Yeah, but you know, no, you know what I mean. I'm just like whatever. <laughs> yeah, I know, so we, yeah. we, we, we did. Get I get the one. Room. I get one negative review on on the podcast, and I, I, you know, it cries like sit a baby, in a dark room me. for a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and of course, without post Gallifrey, the, the, you know, it's not like Twitter. Each post is like a four pages long. So when someone doesn't like you, you know, that's some bedtime reading. That's <laughs> you know, that's a whole essay. But I, I'll just go back to Paul brief, briefly. Although there was real uncertainty at first, and also I think he had an, I don't want to talk out of turn. I think he was generally having a rough time, and I think he like he, he suffered from insomnia. And being locked in a studio for seven days is doing Doctor Who will drive you bonkers. With the best will in the world, will drive you insane. So it was tough, but we did find our stride. And like you know. I'd say that this Louise analogy is really good because, you know, we we did a, a convention, online convention during the pandemic, and it was just so lovely to see him again. And we're all, you know, we found our way that like, yeah, it's me in India and this odd ball. And we just got, we kind of got into our little groove and both uh, Paul and I love cinema and we found, we found our level and, and he was really helpful in a lot of just stuff that you, if you haven't done audio, you just don't know. I remember India walking in and saying that she, on her first day, she just didn't know to breathe. So she'd say her line and just hold her breath and wonder why this woman's getting blue in the corner. And also paper, when we, we weren't using iPads, very hard to wrangle paper in a seed change. You know, you're mid-rant and you've got to sort of do all this stuff with paper. It's really, really hard. And he was just like, five page scene, page one in your left hand, two, three and four on the stand, page five in your right and that stuff can just save your life and turn you from being a bit of a mess into knowing. It. And he taught me so much about that stuff. So, and I've got enormous respect for Paul. It has to be said. Mm. So you, you come back for the second season, of course, I said just before the Grace got released, after you've actually already recorded your first season, it's announced Doctor Who's coming back. Uh, but suddenly, you know, Gary and Big Finish realize there might be a huge intake of new fans once the show starts. And they've got the most recent Doctor whacked away in a divergent universe that isn't making a lot of sense to anybody yet. So we have to bring you back. And so your second season comes out, which is just rushed, I think probably in some ways rushed in terms of trying to finish the storyline of the divergent universe and get everyone back again. Um, what's the feeling like in terms of the fact that what should have taken four or five seasons to unpack and explain is suddenly now pushed into two and you're back to back to the real universe? Yeah, um, we didn't really know, you know, what was going on behind the scenes, particularly. So we're not there worrying about the script. The script just uh, the only the first thing we know about a script is a heavy thud on the door, and you hear it you know, as it comes through the mat. So we didn't really know about all that scrambling. Obviously, we knew Doctor Who was coming back. In fact, I was out with Clayton Hickman, Scott Gray, and Spoltz, Tom Spilsbury from Doctor Who magazine, and I took them to see a play. And then afterwards, Clayton had a took a call. And he just said, or had a message from Mark Gatiss. He goes, I've just had a message from Mark Gatiss. Three words, it's coming back. And that's when we all discovered it was coming back. It was a very cool night. None of us have ever forgotten that. Um, so we knew it was coming back. And I kind of, I think I just thought, well, this probably means the end for this. And I remember the next life 
there was a palpable sense of we may never do one again. Um, and there was a weird moment where I went to India's house and I remember Nick Brigg was there. And I think me and India were thinking about calling it a day, like the two of us just going, let's, you know, it's better to leave a party early than before being asked to leave. So maybe we should go and maybe we should go together. And I remember Nick going, oh, this is just like when it's like being there when Wendy Pabry and Fraser Hines decided to leave together. Um, but then I think one of us or two of us were offered a check for a job and we're actors and we need food and electricity. So we both said yes and just kept on doing it. Um, but but I think at the next life, like, I was very aware that this could be the last one because I was excited as a Doctor Who fan that it was coming back. So I was just like, never mind, big finish. What's, what's happening here? Um, and, I'd be, and I can't remember when this was, but I got to go. To, and again, this is just me being jammy. I knew somebody who worked on, was working on the new series. And she said, oh, do you want to come down and have a look? So we went down to, I think it was Flanethley and this deserted building where they were filming the long game. And we got to look at the sets and the props and they were like oh do you want to come and see the TARDIS and I'm like yes please and I was so shocked to see police box doors I was like well that's a nice prop but where's the TARDIS and then you know she opened the doors and I had that moment of walking up the ramp and seeing this coral control room for the first time so it was it was just wild I have to show you I brought one thing because there were props everywhere we walked into a room I've still got a photo of it and there was we didn't know what they were but the Cassandra was there, sort of just propped up against the wall, the face of Bo, half a Dalek. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to nick something because I'm an actor. And we always, actors, we love to nick things. So I nicked one thing and I've got it here to, to show you. So I, I chose, out of all those things, I chose to nick this. It is, oh, oh, on, so sorry. it's one of the missing posters. It's fairly modest. It was basically, it was sitting on a stack of photocopying paper and it's the missing, one of the missing posters from Rose Tyler. And I nicked that and framed it. So that was the cool thing I nicked um, as a side hop. But um, yes, yeah, so you... framed too. Thank you, dude. Thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, we knew it was coming back. So basically I just thought the next life was it really. And the, but they, then they had that cliffhanger. Yeah, they had that cliffhanger. So I guess I must've known it was coming back. But I don't know. I, I think just mentally, we when the TV show came back and I knew it was come back. I think mentally, I just thought this is this is going to wind up soon. And I was amazed we went as long as it did. I think Gary said that the subscription when people said it was heard it was coming back, the subscriptions just vanished, yep. and they were like, "We don't know how we're going to afford this next series. The money's gone." But then I think when they realised how long it was going to be for the show to come back, I think they, I think well, they, I think they, the subscriptions subscriptions did sort of creep back up again yeah 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 Uh, speaking of the next life it it must have been pretty cool to have uh, paul darrow as your dad are you kidding me and big finish have always done very well with the casting and i my big finish parents are so paul darrow is playing my dad let's all just take a moment for that but then later on in the gallifrey series i was playing a completely different character and i was playing the son of my mum who was mary tam so my big finish parents are paul darrow and mary tam and i was like Actually, that's kind of that kind of works. Very in some, cool. In some bizarre way, I could kind of see that. Very. I'd already worked with Michael Keating, who was, you know, amazing, and he was so much. There's little moments where he's you just see him being Villa. You know, there was a moment where he was talking about his wife's schizophrenia, and he was like, "Oh, yeah, my wife's schizoph- schizophrenic," and then he just looked off to the distance and said rather wistfully. But then again, you're never alone with with schizophrenia, and then just in a sort of Villa, slightly sad way. And I was like, "Oh my god, you're really Villa, Paul Darrow." was the full Darrow. Um, uh, I think Gary introduced me to him saying, he's playing your son. And he went, he's too old to be my son. And I was like, oh God, we're in for a day of it here. Um, <laughs> but he was lovely. We had to then go out and have our photos taken. And on our way, I thought, right, I'll just put in a good word. So I said to Paul, like, I'm really excited to work, to work with you. I love Blake Seven. And my mum's very excited because she always used to say about you, oh, he can put his slippers under my bed any day of the week. And Paul went, <laughs> send her my love. Like smooth as <laughs> pure darrow. He darrowed, he gave that the next life a good darrowing. And yeah, what an absolute thrill. This is the dream come true stuff. You know, I've had a good moan about Boohoo, people were mean to me on the internet, but like the highs are ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. So yeah, and he was brilliant, like that lovely voice. He's really, really nice, really nice performance. Doctor Who, the next life. You know what I want, girl. Did you find it? No. Ah. Well, never.
Never mind, it's not so important now. Now then, you want to see some real magic, yes? I knew it. Very well. You will not make it through the night. No one ever has. But if he does... He has the right to hunt down his accuser. He has what? You heard, Keep. Tally-ho, Guidance. Tell these men I concur. Now, most places in my universe, the condemned man gets a hearty meal. Who's there? It's me, my love. Just seeing how you are this morning. Today's the day. Today? What? There's something here, Doctor. Something that makes what this planet does happen. All I needed was help. Someone ready and willing and able. And then when you got washed up, well, I thought, perhaps there's something in this God stuff after all. You know, my hero. <laughs> I'm no hero, Perfection. No? You look like one to me. Up until this stage, all the Eighth Doctors are being released, you know, sort of the, a new season coming in blocks and it really, you know, one after another. Um, after this, though, once we go back to the real universe, it takes 18 months before the next release. Um, even though you record three or four together about 12 months later, but they're now then being released not in sequence. So, you know, every three or four months, yeah. the next one yeah. comes out. Um, so you just, it, it's all just slipped back into the normal range. Yeah. Um, did, did you notice that that had happened in terms of, was there much change? Does it affect you at all in terms of your performances or getting together? Mm. And, not, not to and, the end of are you still reading the fan responses and getting depressed at this stage, or um, given yeah, up by now? I have to be fair. Like, let's be fair. Like, I wasn't like obsessively trying to kind of <laughs> see everything. But the thing is, I'm a Doctor Who fan, so I'm gonna, yeah. you know, I was on there anyway, trying to find out about the new series. So you just after, and to be honest, after a while, you just you know, by that time, I'd kind of had that initial kicking, and by then, I was pretty. The exoskeleton was real. I would after after a while, I was fine with it. Um, but. Uh, what was what no we weren't aware of it in terms of it didn't make any difference to us when they're released but what was what was lovely and it was so helpful because all, all alongside this this is like while doctor who is one of the most important things in my life this really was a side job compared to what i was really doing because during all of this i was sort of you know touring and having a stint in the west end and doing like my main actual focus in my life was all my theater stuff so this just slotted in very very nicely and the beauty of it is Anytime you went to an audition or anywhere, they always say, so what have you been doing? And I was always able to say, oh, I've, an audio play of mine is just out. Or, oh, next month an audio play is out. Or, oh, I'm just recording. So there was always something, you were always doing something because these things were peppered, uh, you know, throughout your year. So it was a really good support. It was always, it was really lovely. And to be honest, useful having this stuff as a, as a sort of sideline, really. Um, but yeah, it, it, I don't think it made any difference. I loved... I, I know I loved Terra Firm and I really loved other other lives like very very much. They were they were two of my favourites. I think. Speaking of Terra Firma, um, is that where you brought your old friend Lizzie Hopley in? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, you're right. I think there was a. It wasn't like I was pestering to get her in there, but I think I'd mentioned her to Gary, and then a role came up, and you remember him phoning me, and I was like, yeah, I was back temping at Twentieth Century Fox. Yeah, and he phoned me and went, "This Lizzie Hopley, what's she like? What to do?" And I was like, I told her how fantastic she was, and yeah, he did get her in uh, with Gemma and Sampson, who came in, and 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 Lizzie's a Lizzie's a one of the most remarkable actors I've ever, one of the most remarkable people, because she is so curious and productive she's one of the most productive people i have ever met and her and dawny are unbelievable you know are just unbelievable they're just powerhouses and she's so creative and she does she like at any given moment lizzie hopley is writing plays she's she's starring in plays she's doing she does amazing things that you never get to hear about because she's got so much stuff on the go but yeah she was she was really brilliant in that and i was also quite pally with joe lidster as well because i think weird we had kind of lots of conversations. He'd had a certain re reaction to the rapture that he'd put out, and I'd had a certain reaction to my stuff I'd put out. So we kind of bonded over over how we deal with all of that. Um, but yeah, Terra Firma was great, and Lizzie, yeah, of course she played uh, so Gemma and Sampson with Lee Ingleby, and I think Paul McGowan would happily swap being India, like get these two middle class twits out of here, and let's get Lee Ingleby, and uh, I think he'd have happily swapped. <laughs> I don't blame him. 
Yeah, and you mentioned other lives too. That's probably my my favourite post divergent arc story. You like the comedies as well, huh? Yes, but there is a darkness in other lives that's yeah that's that's always that's always present, and um, I love well I love that era of history, and I think it was a really clever way to get the alien carers uh, sort of inserted into that story, put him into a freak show. Um, I think that was the perfect thing. Was it difficult? Do you think to get different situations for carers to fit into as that alien character? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of always surprised they let him, you know, if I'd have been a producer, I'd probably left him at the next life and said, goodbye, thanks for helping the universe, but we're off. Like, I mean, that makes sort of sense. So I was really surprised and always very grateful that they kept me on, even though they'd cur curtailed the arc. I think Gary's like, well, it's not his fault that we could curtailed it, let's keep him on. Um, but there was that, as you say, there was that real question of like, what do we do? How do we make it work? And I remember in a bar in bristol you know because you'd stay up and sort of chatting and stuff and i remember us saying when I, I said like what about a french farce it'd be quite funny like to make a feature of the fact they're trying to hide what he's like and i said what, what about a french farce they're trying to hide him in the cupboard and all this kind of stuff and i said you could i said i do i was kind of just sort of saying there are ways that you can make this guy not fitting in actually quite funny and gary hopkins in other lives did that brilliantly like yeah locked in a freak show ridiculous disguises outrageous accents i'm so sorry to the people of france uh, me and india would, should have just been shot for that um but like uh yeah it was really fun and i, I liked that and I, I i enjoyed the fact that there was some yeah making a feature of like who are you what a weirdo and i started to get a bit more of that because of course he was in these situations where people were like who the hell are you and actually that gave that gave me a lot more it actually that really helped the actual mm. that grit kind of helped because i don't I, I don't know about you but i'm not really interested in like hello i'm a space person from the space universe i'm like who cares like it's nice to get a bit of grit of people saying you're a freak and then you know what are you is that like so in, in a way it actually helped that kind of yeah that, that kind of yeah that's kind of bumping up against the world really helped a lot i think i do think he was an essential part of drama if you haven't got humour to get the highs, you don't get the lows either. And I think sometimes yeah. a lot of authors can take themselves way too seriously. And once once you lose the humour, you lose the interest. I've, I've been reflecting um, watching Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Brave New Worlds. And Brave New Worlds I adore. It's hilarious. It's great fun. It has terrifying episodes, it has, but it has total comedy episodes. Discovery just takes itself too seriously. And I'm just thinking, I'm just turning off. I just... Every episode is just too serious. And where's the fun? And you don't want to be with, when it's no fun, you just don't want to be there. And I think, you know, the, one of the winning degrees of Doctor Who is it's fun and you want to be there. And so, yeah, I think, I think a lot of, a lot of these stories you had, um, but you had lots of experimental writers. It's interesting looking through the writers that you had. So many of them only did one or two stories would be finished. And that means that Gary would have been working his pants off, no doubt, script ed editing as well, because trying to get the scripts together. Um, yeah, I think lots of people are doing a lot of work to make things work. Um, I would just put out another one in that block, Scaredy Cat, which we've also done a review on. It's a really, you know, Dwayne's scariest episode. Um, worth mentioning just in terms of that as well. Another, another Lizzie Hoppy being terrifying. Was Lizzie in no, that? No, I think, no, oh, it, no? Sca Scaredy Cat, it's Night Thoughts, Lizzie Hoppy. Oh, it's Night That's Thoughts. A, yeah. That's Scaredy right, Cat, I thought you were talking about because I absolutely despise the story. Uh, yeah, it's right. probably my least favourite story. Looking, you're I, right, was watching I, was, video. I was looking at Dwayne like, are you all right, mate? What's going on for you? <laughs> like, you scared to catch your favourite story. You okay, hon? Yeah, but you're then, right. I'm just, I'm just having nice thoughts, aren't I? It's similar covers. I, there you go. I did want to ask you something about that. Do you remember much about, I know it's only a day's recording, but Arthur Boscombe, it was his only ever appearance in, that's a pronunciation of his name, isn't it? Uh, Bostrom. Bo Arthur, Bostrom. Oh, Bostrom, sorry. Bostrom. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I love my LOLO. So there's been a few uh, actors from there. Do you remember much about that recording and, and him? Yeah, I remember. The, the, it's, it's, it's very corny, but of course you always do remember the people. Um, and the people I remember from that were Ros Blessed, Brian, Ble uh, Brian Blessed's daughter. And I think I knew her through 
Caroline Morris, who played Eremem, they were buddies, and we'd be, we'd had some we'd had some actor parties with a lot of incidents and red wine and shenanigans. So I knew her, and she was great. And Arthur Bostrom, I was really excited about for the same reasons, and he was great. He was very fun. I think Nigel Fares knew him, and I think Nigel brought in a lot of um, people. Michael Chance, I hope I've got his name right, but yeah. They, so I think I, I think he knew quite a lot of the other cast. So I think they were quite. So he seemed very comfortable and was very warm and lovely. I don't have anything sort of scandalous or anything interesting to say about him, but he was great, and I, I loved working with him. So Gary heads off to BBC Wales and joins Doctor Who, and Nick Briggs takes over as executive producer. Uh -huh. um, and you have one more story, as <laughs> curious. Um, is that, was it Nick's decision in terms of, it's just time to wrap up this whole, everything, wrap up you, wrap up Charlie, just move on with what he wanted? How did that all come about? Yeah, I've no idea. Because after Gary, I think when Gary was there, I lived, I lived in South London as well. So I was part of the, you know, Broccoli Collective or whatever they were called, you know, Joe Lidstall or whatever. There was sort of, we were all knocking about a bit. And I think after Memory Lane, I really didn't think we were doing any more. I'd saw I'd by that time I'd kind of really let it go. And I think the TV show had started or I think after memory lane, I just has, had assumed we weren't doing any more. And when the new re regime came in, I never imagined for a moment. I just kind of, I just kind of closed the door on it. I just thought, Oh, oh well, that was an amazing run. Gary's gone to Cardiff. You know, we're back in the universe as a new regime. I just imagined they wouldn't want to do it. So I was really thrilled when I got a call from Nick saying, hey, we're going to do a last story, um, which is, I just thought was really good of them just because it probably wasn't their bag or, you know, obviously if you start a new range, you want to do a clean slate, completely start again. So the fact that they tied that up and honoured it at all, I was really, really chuffed about. Um, and also there's a, there's a missing story. I've actually got a script for one of a story that was going to be made but then got shelved because of the uh of switching it back to the new universe or whatever um so there's actually an eighth doctor charlie and kerry's missing story and i've got the script so that's it's kind of quite, it's quite cool being a doctor who you feel like oh, i'm really in doctor who because one of my stories is missing that's great um, you so that's share, it, share it later i'd love to see it <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it was Barnaby Edwards who was directing. I'd never worked with him before. So it was new director, new producer, new everything. But I was just really, or genuinely, I was surprised to be asked back. Uh, but I was really grateful that they just ended it. They wanted to do an ending story. So, I, you know, really, really grateful for that. So. And did you always film in Bristol? Did you always go to where Paul was? No, it started off in Bristol. We used to hike down to Bristol for a week, which was brilliant because it was a very cool studio. Massive Attack uh, were rec re recorded in there as well. So that felt very, very cool. Then I think it was the moat mainly in Brixton. Was that the one in Brixton? I think mm. it was. Um, that's when I did most of them. That's where I recorded most of my stuff. Then I think they moved on to Ladbroke Grove or somewhere else. Um, but yeah, mo so yeah, Bristol and the moat were my two main places in fact i think no i did i again like you see i'm terrible actors don't trust them anywhere i you know was in the booth and i remember i thought i'm just going to write my name here like i don't know why i wrote something silly but i put my name on there i remember coming back six months later and then it was the, the wall was completely black with actors just like writing their own name so i think i started that that tradition when i left we used to do these signings these long like six hours signings down in uh barking at 10th planet um but I, I sold a load of my scripts at the end of it um partly again i'm an actor i'm trying to keep food and I'm trying to keep the lights on um but also i just thought you know they're just sitting in a cupboard gathering dust and i remember the zagreus one i remember giving that to a guy so you know the guy bought it and i just wrote on there to his name's rory to rory look after it you know love conrad and i said to him so i was like good luck have fun autographing that and then I think last year on Twitter, I just got this DM with, and he said, I looked after it. And there's a copy of Zagreus and it's signed by everybody. And that's just, that's just beautiful. I mean, that's, and again, you know what? I think this is important to say. I mean, I've, like you said, I've sort of had very mixed feelings about my time on Big Finish. I, I love it. But of course, I've got reservations and it was a mixed experience. Um, but you forget about Doctor Who. It never, I've known Doctor Who all my life, but I'd forgotten this when, and it was this guy, Rory, he said to me, he's like, I lived in a little village. I was very lonely. 
awkward kid, didn't know what's going on. I was trying to deal with my own stuff. And he said, every time your CDs came in the post with your team, that was my team and it got me through. And I just thought, I never even occurred to me that we could, we would be someone's team. And the, But of course, Doctor Who does that. Whatever version of Doctor Who you see, that is someone's version. And I hadn't, and that has got to be the biggest that's the best thing in the world, isn't it? If you're to be, to be, to to think that you could have been part of the Doctor Who that gave them all of this, all the joy and stuff it gives all of us, and and just to have been part of that, that is, that's a big kick. So that that makes everything better, basically. For for me, you guys for five years were Doctor Who. You were the new Doctor Who. I loved all the other stuff. I loved all the other characters. Love all the other Doctors, but they were just slotting into the canon as it was you guys were creating new Doctor Who. And so year by year, you get a new season come out and some of the seasons you loved and thought were fantastic. Other seasons you thought, oh, there's a good one in there. These, yeah, these ones, yeah. But it was, you were the new Doctor Who, new new series every year. And that that's to me what I was waiting for every year. What was coming new for Doctor Who? That was you guys. That's amazing. And it never goes away. And of course it never goes away. Like this is 20 years, 20 years ago, I started doing this and I'm still talking about it. I know we will hear people say that Doctor Who, people say that, but even though you know, you think you know this stuff, it still takes you by surprise. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, when I did see Paul in India, you know, it just occurs to you like we, like the three of us have been through something that no, no one else has ever done or ever will again. And, and it is, I was talking earlier about like we to come back to the question about what it's like being a companion is like it, there's so much there is the act the characters of being a supporting character but then there's also being a, how it how it falls down in the studio like you've got a lead man who you've got to support and your guest cast it's a bit like going to the TARDIS like in in the moat studios the door was blue you'd go in and there's a big control room in there and there's just the three of you and then tomorrow you arrive somebody else and a whole load of new people turn up and it's just the three and you three stay the same while all the people each each adventure is new people and new things it is a weird old job and it's it's brilliant it's still it's still big a big part of my life and i'm under no illusions this is the thing that will outlast me and that i'll be remembered for and that's like well if it's dog two then you know hooray Corey, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you for your recollections. I hope we can get you back in the future when we do some randomoids and hit some of your stories um, because I've adored talking to you tonight and looking forward to future conversations. Dwayne and Philip, thank you so much. This has been a real kick. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, for your education, enlightenment and edification. What are we waiting for? Come along. Where are we going? To pay our respects to the Duke of Wellington. We want Monsieur de Roche and his wife to return home to France with good reports of the exhibition. Police public call box. Christian, have you ever seen anything quite like this before? No, my dear. Of all the curious artifacts on display, this is surely one of the most curious. The Crystal Palace, designed by Joseph Paxton to house the great exhibition of the works... The works of industry of all nations, Hyde Park, London, the year 1851. It wouldn't do to let them think that there's been any resistance to this great showcase of industry. Quite, quite. Or that the British public aren't completely united in their support for Queen and government. Yes, all right, for Zachary. Help! Help me! Shout as loud as you like. No one can hear you. And even if they did, they wouldn't do anything about it. Not here, not in this place. Tell me if I'm wrong. Despite the long absence, you are still unwell. I'm not who you think I am. If that were true, then you would not be here. I I would not invite a perfect stranger into my home. But you are here. Only because I have nowhere else to go. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a very special surprise. No expense has been spared to bring to you, for the first time tonight, the latest addition to my parade of oddities. (sighs) How did that happen? Well, once again, Conrad, thanks so much for being with us. We uh, appreciate that. Can you stick around and uh, give us a recommendation of something? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But, Uh, but, But with our recommendations... Uh, for some reason, my list always says that it's Philip's turn to go first. Great. Well, I'll go first then. Um, I actually mentioned this one along the way. I'm going to recommend The Natural History of Fear. 
It is unbelievably experimental. It is wacky as, no, wacky is the wrong word. It's experimental. It, it is not like any other Doctor Who story you will get. It has an amazing conclusion that you're not expecting. The sound design is magnificent. And a lot of it is just a spinning top. In fact, that's the cover is a spinning top um, with some very amusing pictures on the, sp- on the, on the, on the top itself. I remember listening to this the first time and thinking, what the heck is going on? And it doesn't really make sense to get to the end, though there's some amazingly powerful scenes throughout. And so it's a series of very powerful scenes, trying to work out how they connect together. And then at the end, you understand what's happened. And yeah, so. In, in the last two minutes, it's like, oh, now I get it. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, no spoilers for this one at all. But I really recommend it. It's, yeah, it's like nothing else Big Finish has done before or after. And, um, yeah, really worth listening to. So that's, that's my recommendation. Very good. That's be close to my recommendation because it's one of my favourites too. I'm glad you recommended it. It's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant story. What about you, Conrad? What have you been listening to or, or watching? Anything you like? Yeah, I've got, a few, I've got a few things here. So, firstly, I've got to... So, the Doctor Who podcast world is something I'm very, very involved in and love dearly. So, I've got to shout out. I'm going to give you... My so a top five uh, podcasts to to subscribe and listen to. Um, one is we've talked about Kenny Smith, the wonderful Big Finish archivist. I have to shout out to his podcast, Pieces of Eighth, that he does with Rebecca Chapman. If you like Big Finish and you like the Eighth Doctor and Paul McGann, Pieces of Eighth, subscribe to that. The next is Flight Through Entirety with my very dear friends Brendan Jones and Nathan Bottomley. If there's any planet in which you're not subscribed to that, subscribe to that immediately. Um, Doctor Who Literature, for those of you who like books, that is a wonderful, wonderful uh, podcast going through all the Target books in publication order and is a wonderful, wonderful listen. That's an essential. Um, a new one I've, that I was appeared on recently called Too Hot for TV. Uh, two brothers, Dylan and Jackson Reese. It's a really, really funny, quite cool podcast. They really know their stuff and they do everything that wasn't any everything about Dog 2 that wasn't on TV. And my sort of personal favorite is Trap One, which reviews any aspect of Doctor Who at all. A wonderful team of people, and I'm one of the co-hosts. So if you want to hear more of this nonsense, then listen to Trap One. But in terms of like a drama or something to listen to or watch, um, I, I was actually in the studio yesterday recording something that I'm very excited about. And I've been told I'm allowed to say this much about it. It's not Doctor Who. Um, but in the 80s, I don't know if you got this in Australia. There was another show on Saturday night, Robin of Sherwood. Did you guys get that in Australia yes. with Michael Prade and all that? And that? Well, like Doctor Who, there are official audios of these with the original cast, Michael Prade, Ray Winston, all of those, those gang. And as part of the 40th anniversary celebration of Robin of Sherwood next year. Um, I can't, what am I allowed to say? I've done a little, a small play with an amazing guest actor, not one of the leads, a guest actor um, who, and he's a big, amazing actor who's reprising a character he played in the original series. Um, a lot of these audios are available. I think you can get them on Audible. So go to wherever you get your audio books and stuff and look up Robin of Sherwood. Um, so yeah, Robin of Sherwood. Barnaby Eaton Jones, right? That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Very good. And what about you, Dwayne? What are you going to recommend? Well, I'm going to recommend an Eighth Doctor, Kerry's and Charlie audio as well. And I've already mentioned it. I'm going to recommend Other Lives. It's one of my favourites from the non-divergent universe. Um, apart from being an amazing story that really deals, I think, well with Kerry's, and as you've already said, it's got some amazing accents in it um, and lots of humor um, there are also some very dark elements too uh, it's a very dark period in history in some ways in some in some corners and it deals with that well we've also got um, a, a, an interesting story for the eighth doctor as well being mistaken for someone else and so he features on the cover of that CD uh, sporting a very different look a bearded eighth doctor so I really enjoy other lives so that's my recommendation yeah it's a great story i thought you were gonna go the faith stealers but there you go no other lives okay well once again thank you so much conrad it's been a pleasure to have your company thank you guys and thank you philip 
appreciate you, your Dwayne. company too. You know I do. Yeah, and I appreciate yours too, Dwayne. Oh, thanks, mate. All right, we'll catch you all next time. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 174, How to Be Invisible, with our guest Conrad Westmass and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny celebrating 20 years of 8th Doctor companion Kerry's. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. More about us from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audio files. We'll hear you next time.